Spirit. And so grant to us help in the preaching and hearing of your word. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So can we just read uh, again those first five verses of Galatians 1, uh, which is our, uh, our text really today, these five verses. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God this present evil world will of God and our Father to whom be glory forever Amen Amen Paul's writing a letter and we've all uh, been taught at some time or other how we're supposed to begin a letter and how we're supposed to end a letter and uh, if like me a lot of those lessons have been forgotten we don't live in an age of letter writing anymore, texting, thing and so forth has really uh, paid to any idea of proper uh, formal addresses and knowing how to address people. Well, Paul, if he was writing this letter not as a first century Jew uh, with a, a bit of a Greek hint in terms of his thinking uh, and living in a Roman world, and he began his letters like we do, dear so-and-so, I would have addressed this letter to the Galatians. I submit this morning that he could have, he may well have, because in some sense he did, begin in a quite a remarkable and, if you were receiving the letter, I think an alarming way. Imagine getting the letter and it said, Dear fools. You wouldn't really uh, be willing to listen to much more, perhaps. But remember, Paul is the one who in chapter 3 says, Oh, Foolish Galatians, dear fools. Well, if nothing else, it would get your attention, wouldn't it? it? Might get your back up, it might distract you for the rest of what he has to say, but it, you might think, well, why does he say that? What does he mean by that? Why is he calling us fools? It's also a letter that he could have said, dear recovering addict. Why would he write a letter like that? Well, because was here uh, in the churches in the region of Galatia, there is something of an addiction. Here are people that have, by some, called recovering addicts, addicted to Judaism, addicted to rules, and they are recovering addicts. And the problem with the recovering addict is that they were never really that far away from the thing that they were addicted to. Uh, I remember going to visit people. I stayed with them some weekends in, in Edinburgh, who were originally from Northern Ireland, a, a man and his wife who were ministering down there. And when I was in Dundee, I would go down the occasional weekend to, to stay with them. And uh, he had been an alcoholic. And simple anything really could set him off and uh, stir up cravings. And even at Christmas time, I remember his wife saying, she had to be careful which mince pies she bought because even brandy essence or something like that uh, would be enough to really adversely affect him. And so, although he hadn't touched drink in many, many years, there's a sense in which he was still a recovering addict. And these people are recovering addicts, addicted to Judaism. But it's not them. We are all recovering addicts. Because we are all at heart good Pharisees. Like that we can do to observe God's favor or to keep God's favor. Something that depends upon us in order to satisfy God, to get more of God's approval. That if I do this, that, or the other thing, God will be pleased with me. And God will love me more. God will feel good about me. And, and I'll improve my standing with God. Now, that thinking seems to be somewhat sensible. We understand that. And that's part of our problem, that we do understand that. Because that's how we often think. 
not as set over against the truth of the gospel. That if Jesus Christ has done everything that is necessary to earn God's approval, and the only way that we can come to God is through Jesus Christ, then it's not possible to add anything to what Jesus Christ has done. Because if we just think about it in my life, to make God believe of me or love me or love me more than he does in Jesus Christ, we are then implying that what Jesus Christ did was not really enough. Because I can make it better. I can add to it by what I do. And you see, that's Phariseeism in practice. It's the religion of the add-ons. The religion of the add-ons. But once you keep adding stuff on, then you've distorted and changed the original thing. It's no longer what it really is. And that's the danger of Phariseeism, of the religion of the add-ons. That you either push to one side completely the original item, what is really true, and all you end up are lots of add-ons, or you, you so mar and deface and bury the original that it, it no longer becomes important. The add-ons become the most important thing. And the difficulty, as we've sort of pointed out briefly before, is that we are called to obey God. We are called to uh, come to convictions about things that have to do with the worship of God and our knowledge of God. There are issues in the Christian life that are important. Important enough for us to have a firm conviction about what we do, how we worship God, for example. But we can start turning that on its head. We can raise it to a level of importance that is out of place, where it competes with the gospel. It competes with grace. And we attach more significance to other things that we do and saying, well, if we do those things, God loves us more. And if somebody else, if another professing Christian doesn't do what I do, then somehow they are inferior to me. They are substandard. God maybe doesn't think quite as much of them. And that's the thinking of the Pharisee. I am better than someone else because I do certain things, and I do them more, and I do them in a better way than they do. I say more prayers, therefore I'm better than him. Read more of my Bible, therefore I'm better than her. I come more services, therefore I'm a better Christian. And that's the kind of thinking that we have. And that is conflicting with the gospel of grace because what makes us a Christian is the grace of God that has come to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Christ is the gospel in that sense. And it's keeping Christ in his right place. And the gospel of grace where it ought to be that makes us a Christian and keeps us being Christians and will make us the better Christian if we want to think of it in that language. It's all about Christ and the grace of God. So don't get distracted with the add-ons. Make sure that we understand what is of vital and central importance. Somebody told the story about the lady that went to the pet shop to buy a parrot. And uh, she, she bought the parrot on Monday. But she came back in on Tuesday morning and she was complaining that her parrot wasn't talking and making sort of part like noises. And so the pet shop owner said, well, uh, what you need to get for your bird is a ladder. He needs a little ladder so he can come up and down onto his perch. So she buys the ladder on Tuesday and goes home. Wednesday morning she returned. Part still isn't talking. What am I going to do to get my part to talk? And so the pet shop owner said, buy him a bell. Buy your part a bell. He'll have a little bell to knock, ring. He'll be a happy part and he'll talk. So she buys the bell on Wednesday morning, goes home. Comes in on Thursday morning, same old story, my part won't talk. And the pet shop owner says he needs a mirror. Buy him a mirror. He can look at himself in the mirror. That'll cheer him up and he'll talk. So Thursday morning, buys the mirror, goes home again, comes back Friday morning. You'll never guess. Part still isn't talking. What will I do? Pet shop owner says, buy him a little uh, plastic uh, part friend. You can put that in the cage and he'll feel as if he's got company. And when he's got company, he'll be happy. And he'll talk. And so she buys the plastic part on Friday morning and goes home. Pet shop closes for the weekend. She's back in the morning. And this time she says, my part's dead. The ladder didn't work. The bell didn't work. The mirror didn't work. And this plastic body didn't work. And the pet shop owner says, did the part say anything before it died? 
She said, well, it did speak before it died. What did it say, he said? It said, does that pet shop not sell any food? <laughs> now, the moral of the story is, we can be so busy adding things on to Christ that we miss Christ himself. We become so distracted by other issues. In a sense, they have an importance in the right place. But if they detract from Christ, if they take up his place in our lives, then what's happening? We're starving. And really, that, that's what this letter is, is about to people who were so busy adding other things on that they had no food. And so they were starving and they were famishing. And so we, we come to just the introduction part of the letter in, in typical Pauline fashion, which was typical for the time in which he was living. We want to just notice with uh, the time that we have and with God's help this morning, then uh, a number of things here uh, in this uh, introductory statement, these first five verses. We see who wrote the letter, who he wrote it to, and what the essence of the letter is about, all about. So we learn about who is Paul. We learn about who the Galatians are. We learn about who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And we learn about who the gospel, in a sense, is for. Those four things. Who is Paul? Who are the Galatians? Who is Jesus Christ? And who is the gospel for? Well, first of all, who writes the letter? Very simply, the first word, Paul. Now, we can't say much more. So the parenthesis, not neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. In the original, it's uh, three words, the first three words, Paul, apostle, not. Now he's not saying Paul, not an apostle. He's saying Paul, an apostle. And then there's this, this not statement. Uh, he's not an apostle in any wrong kind of sense. Now, what apostle, first of all, before we notice what Paul was saying? Well, an apostle, uh, we think of him as being someone sent, a sent one. Uh, apostles, the apostles of Christ, were not the only kinds of apostles in the ancient world. Uh, other people were apostles in the sense that they were deputies. They were ambassadors, if you like. Perhaps the best way to think of it in modern day terms if someone is invested with the power of, a, uh, of attorney, then they have the right to act on somebody else's. They make decisions for them as them. So if you have the power of attorney, and somebody has given you that power of attorney, they are saying, you can act on my behalf. You can make decisions about my financial affairs. You can make decisions about my health affairs. And those people that you're dealing with, it's as if they're dealing with me. So you're acting in my behalf. That's what an apostle was. They were acting in and on behalf of Jesus Christ. So they had authority to speak. So that when they spoke, they were speaking as Jesus Christ. When they were teaching, apostolic teaching was not just a preacher preaching a sermon. Apostolic teaching was the teaching of Jesus Christ. When, they, when an apostle spoke, it was exactly the same thing as if the Lord Jesus Christ himself was speaking. When they made a decision as an apostle, they were making a decision, a ruling, that was just the same as if the Lord Jesus Christ was still on earth making that decision. These were Christ's apostles. So you can see this is a very important work. They are speaking and living and acting and guiding the church in the place of the ascend at Lord Jesus Christ. He had left them here for that purpose. So what happens if someone comes along, he says that he's an apostle, but he's not? There's a problem, isn't there? Because he's telling people, well, I'm speaking in the name of Christ. I'm telling you what Jesus wants you to know. I'm leading the church in a particular direction, and this is what Jesus would have to do. Well, that person could do tremendous damage, couldn't they? They could lead the whole church astray. And so when Paul addresses the church here, he calls himself an apostle, and then he's very quick to change his tact, his direction. No longer is he simply introducing himself, 
but already he's beginning to make a point. He's, if you like, arguing in the right sense. He's making an argument. And the argument that he is making is that he is a true apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, why does he need to do that? Well, he needs to do that because there are those people at the churches in Galatia, in that region, and elsewhere, who call this into question. Is Paul really a true voice of Jesus Christ? Now, that issue is still prevalent today. 2,000 years later, there are still people who call into question the teaching of the Apostle Paul. And on some issues, uh, moral issues today, uh, that affect the church or parts of the so-called Christian church, you will find people who will not uh, accept a quotation perhaps or teaching that is based on passages from Paul. They will say, well, that was Paul's teaching. And what they mean by that is, well, Paul's teaching and the teaching of Jesus Christ are not one and the same. That's their thinking. And for them, they think it's very handy. It means they can dismiss whatever they don't like in Paul. That's funny, ironic, more than funny, that some of these people who think that way quite have a passage like 1 Corinthians 13 all about love and what love is. They like that. They like that bit of Paul. They, they, they like maybe, I don't know, a bit about the fruits of the Spirit. There's certain things that Paul writes about that they like. They're nice. They're inoffensive. But if Paul says anything that is remotely uh, offensive or uh, that is judged to be uh, at odds with the way the world is thinking, controversial, they don't like that. And so they just reject that. And they say, well, that's Paul's idea of Christianity. That's not Christ. So Paul is saying, well, hold on a second. You're calling into question my apostolic credentials. You're saying, basically, you're not a real apostle, Paul. You are uh, sort of a, a Johnny-come-lately. You, you're a, a second-level apostle if there is such a thing. You don't really belong. And so Paul makes this argument stating his position. Not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. He says, I'm... I wasn't made an apostle by some men. I'm not a man-made or a self-made apostle. I am an apostle who was called by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why is it important to establish that? Because as I've said, his teaching of what the gospel is hinges on his apostolic authority. So Paul isn't defending himself. He's not saying, hold on a minute, I don't like this, that people are sort of casting aspersions in my direction, criticizing me, calling into question what I am. This isn't about Paul saying, you, you give me my, my title, give me my dues, call me by my proper title, respect me. See, Paul's not writing this letter to defend himself or to promote himself. He's writing this letter, as he writes all of his letters, to promote the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, to promote the God, to steer people away from ruin, and to defend the apostolic credentials than for the gospel's sake. That's all Paul is concerned about. Read some of the other things that Paul wrote where people are critical of him. And Paul basically says, what they say about me or do to me. It's all about Jesus Christ. And so even when people were preaching and in, or as a consequence of their preaching, they were really trying to get Paul into more trouble. Paul says, well, they might get me into more trouble, but the gospel is being preached and that's the only important thing. So I don't care me. Lesson to learn. But sometimes we want to defend ourselves. And sometimes we want to really put people in their place because we don't like what they're saying about us or thinking of us or, or that kind of thing. And it's very easy to, to start defending self. Well, 
don't be in a rush to defend yourself. But do be careful to defend the Lord Jesus Christ. Be careful to defend his honor. Be quick, be ready to stand up for him. Now, it's easier perhaps because our blood sometimes boils and we get our heckles up about what people say or do towards us. And we're quick maybe to defend ourselves. But if we're going to be quick to do anything, be quick to defend the gospel and to promote the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's who's writing the letter. It's Paul the Apostle. He is a true apostle and we'll come to it in due course in another week or two. Uh, we read at the, uh, toward this first chapter, Paul's making it clear uh, that uh, his conversion, his instruction in the gospel, his call to be an apostle did not rest upon his meeting with other people. It wasn't because he spoke to Peter. It wasn't because Peter laid hands on him or anything like that. He was called by none other than the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Well, secondly then, who does he write to? Well, he says in verse 2, unto the churches of Galatia. So more than one church, we noticed that. As I said before, Galatia was a region, uh, a Roman province, uh, originally sort of two parts, northern Galatia, southern Galatia, but then really made into one large province by the Romans. The, as we said before, the, uh, the sort of uh, ethnicity of the Galatians, uh, especially northern Galatia, uh, where the, the Gauls, Gaul, Asia, so northern France, these Celtic peoples who had uh, conquered and who fought and fought for money and were mercenaries and so on, and had settled that part of northern Turkey. Uh, the southern part wasn't so much so, and the whole region uh, simply had that name, but it didn't necessarily mean that all the people who lived there had that background or heritage. Many of them were uh, people from all different parts of the then known world. Many of them were uh, Romans who had settled uh, in that part of Asia Minor. But he's writing on to these various churches, and if you remember uh, from Acts chapter 13 and 14, we read of some of those cities, Antioch and Iconium, and some, of the town, some of the towns where Christian churches were established in that part of the world. And what's the problem that's uh, affecting them? Well, the, the problem is this Judaizing problem. In fact, uh, if you go to Acts, turn over to Acts. Um, we have to compete with some very noisy machine. Uh, but in Acts, so we've mentioned chapters 13 and 14, uh, which detail for us this part of Paul's missionary journey, establishing churches in those parts of southern Galatia. In chapter 15, we are introduced to this controversy that affected the whole church, which necessitates the first sort of general council in church history, the council at Jerusalem. And we're told at the beginning that certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. <laughs> now, where was it that they came down to, oh, we have to go back to chapter 4, and we'll read that they then sailed, verse 26, they then sailed from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. So here's a problem that's affecting Poseidon Antioch. These Judaizers come, these men come from, from Judea, Israel, and they've got this message. And the message is that, and here it is, you see, you need to add something on. You've listened to this message of the gospel. You're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ to be your savior from all sin. He's your hope of eternal salvation. And that's great, they say, but, and so you're always aware, right, because there's a but, what's coming next? And they say, well, you need something else, you see. There are these elements of Judaism that you must also incorporate. And part of the difficulty here early on in the Christian church is that many of these converts come from a Jewish background. They've been told one day that you're saved not by what you do. Don't rest in your Judaism. Don't rest in your circumcision. Don't rest in, if they were maybe a convert to Judaism, they would have been baptized, there would have been a washing. Don't rest in 
your faithfulness to diet re regulations about not eating pork and so forth. Uh, don't rest or have confidence in your ability to keep certain requirements of legality in terms of worship of God and so on and so forth and when and how many uh, uh, offerings you make and that kind of thing. And now they're being told something different. They're being told, well, you need some of these things. You need to think about these things. You need to consider circumcision if you haven't been circumcised. You need to consider dietary laws, which again will affect the church, churches in Galatia, as we will read in, in the book of Galatians itself. And these people are being unsettled. And so it would appear that Paul writes the letter in and around this time, actually slightly before uh, we come to Acts chapter 15. Why do we say that? Well, uh, quite simply this. After the, the whole church meets and they have representatives sent down to Jerusalem to discuss this question, and it's a question then that affects uh, the rest of the church, so uh, there was some degree of uh, centralization. There's authority that issues out from uh, this assembly that meets at Jerusalem, that it, and the message is passed out to all the Christian churches. So uh, there, there is a sense in which uh, there, there is... Uh, a higher court within the church, and uh, without making it a sermon about something else, this is the idea of Presbyterianism, that kind of idea where there's another body that, that makes rulings that affect local churches, this is one of the places where that would come from. And this message is passed out, and uh, ambassadors from the council are sent out to go to all the other churches and say, look, this is the decision that the council at Jerusalem came to, and you're to abide by them. So when Paul's writing his letter to the Galatians, it would have been very easy for him simply to say, look, those things that you're thinking about in the churches at the present time, these things that are affecting you, calling you away from the gospel, remember the decision that was made at the Council of Jerusalem and abide by it. But he doesn't cite the Council of Jerusalem. He doesn't cite the message that was sent out at that time, which would indicate that he's writing this letter a little, a little time before. So this is a, probably the first letter that Paul ever wrote in his writing ministry. And he writes to them then because they are being troubled in this way. And remember this, if he's just sort of finished establishing these churches in 13 and 14 of Acts, and this troubling Judaizing tendency in a more general sense is only being spoken of in chapter 15, and he's already written to them, that these problems are already beginning to be current amongst them. Notice this, how quickly, how quickly they are being threatened. You might think they've just been saved, they've just been converted. They'll be full of the joy of the Lord, they'll be full of a clear understanding of the gospel. Uh, nobody's going to be able to get in that quickly and pull them away. Nothing's going to be able to distract them that easily. But this happens in a very, very short space or me to be distracted from the Lord Jesus Christ and the truth of the gospel. And part of the danger for us is that we feel assured, self-assured. We feel confident in ourselves. We have a, a thought. It's maybe not at the forefront of our minds, but somewhere in our minds. There's the thought, the idea that, well, I'm all right. Be distracted. I'll not be sort of led away. I'm okay. I'm safe. And we can remember another scripture warning. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Which is why Paul there in Corinthians mentions the children of Israel. Their idolatry in the wilderness. Don't think, he's saying. Don't think for a moment that, that you're different to them. Those people who experienced the miraculous power of God daily, who had a tremendous history of being redeemed, they fell. They fell into idolatry and sin. Don't think for a moment that it won't happen to you. So in one sense, we are totally secure. We're in Christ. We can't fall out of grace. We can't be lost. But at the same time, 
flesh, we can't lose eternal salvation. We can lose certainly the joy of the Lord. We can lose proper perspective. We can become distracted. We can have faltering footsteps, stations of that. We lose the peace. We lose the joy. And we start tasting the bitterness of the world again. And that's never a good thing. But we have to be under no illusion that that can happen. It can happen very quickly after the point at which a person is converted to Christ. It can happen very quickly after a point where a Christian maybe has some experience of renewal in their life. And they think, well, that, now that's it now. It's been settled. I'll never make that mistake again. Don't think that way. That's a dangerous, misguided way of thinking. If these people could so easily and quickly be called away from the gospel, entertaining ideas that were actually contrary to the gospel, it can happen to us too. So we don't live in the fear of that. Don't, don't live in fear. But be on your guard. Be on your guard to the subtleties of the tempter and to the confusion that abounds. So these are the people that the apostle was writing to. What does he say then about the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, notice uh, the words in verse uh, 4 in particular. He says, Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our uh, even before that, we, we could say that because he, he mentions here in verse 1, he talks about the uh, Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So actually, taking both statements together, he talks about the risen Christ before he talks about the crucified Christ. So Paul's chronology doesn't seem to be very good, does it? He, he's uh, taking things back to front. Now, he doesn't always do that uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, remember, uh, he says he died according to the Scriptures and that he was raised again on the third day according to the Scriptures. So he, he puts crucifixion and then resurrection in the chronological order there. Why might he turn it around here? Uh, well, obviously, first of all, because the apostolic credentials, he, he has to be called by a living Savior. And he wasn't called before Christ's death, but he was called by Christ after he was resurrected and ascended. And so he puts that first because that's the first thing that he's uh, identifying talking about here. It's also kind of the order in which you see Paul's testimony developing because his first encounter, if you like, is with the risen Christ. But either way, let's not get bogged down in the chronology of it. But there are two simple facts here. These are facts of history. Paul said, here, here's two fundamental truths about the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ died for sins, and he rose again for our justification. And they're facts of history. Uh, this is not just religious belief. This isn't just what we believe as Christians, and it didn't really happen, but, but we believe it, we accept it. There's no uh, evidence for it, he's not saying. He doesn't believe that for a moment. He said, this is, this is true. Uh, Jesus Christ died, and Jesus Christ rose again. They are evidential, demonstrable facts. They happened. And, and that's where the gospel begins, isn't it? The gospel begins at a point in history. In fact, if you want to take it all the way back, and we'll come to this another time, but to ask the question, well, what is the gospel? And, and where do you begin in giving a definition, definition of what the gospel is? Well, in a sense, the gospel begins at creation, doesn't it? In fact, you could make the point it begins before creation. But either way, it begins with history. Facts about history. God created man. Man sinned. God sent a Savior. That Savior was born. He lived. He died. He rose again. He ascended. He's reigning. He will return. And all things will come to a glorious conclusion, a dramatic conclusion, the consummation of all things. And in a sense, that's the gospel in, in historic terms and uh, the return of Christ, obviously, 
future terms, but there's a history here. And it's important that, again, we uh, realize that history and that we are convinced that, that it happened. Okay, so it's not, I believe it happened. It's not, I think it happened, or I feel it happened. In a sense, it's not even simply enough to say the Bible says it happened. See, the Bible says it happened because it did happen, because it's a fact of history. It's recorded in the Word of God as an accurate record of historical fact. And so Jesus gave himself, he died, and he rose again in history that we need to keep in mind. And then Paul, if we focus more so on the uh, verse 4, what he says about the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and you notice uh, here he says four basic things. Christ who gave himself for our sins. Uh, why did he give himself? That he might deliver us from this present evil world. Uh, what was the effect of it? Well, that we would be delivered. And if you like, why? Why did all of this happen? Uh, according to the will of God our Father. So Jesus Christ gave himself. Well, that reminds us that this was self-sacrifice. The Lord Jesus, remember in John chapter 10, called himself the good shepherd, the good shepherd that giveth his life for the sheep. And he said on that occasion that he had power. He had power to both lay down his life and he had the power to take it again. So the Lord Jesus was talking about a voluntary giving up. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He gave himself for our sins. His life was not taken from him. The Lord Jesus Christ was not a victim in that sense, but he willingly gave himself for us. And over again through the New Testament, this is the message that keeps coming up, that he gave himself a willing, voluntary, selfless sacrifice of himself. The Lord Jesus Christ laid down his life. And it wasn't meaningless, was it? It wasn't an empty gesture. It wasn't just a noble uh, thing for us to behold. It had an effect. Uh, we, we will come uh, it's, it's much sooner probably than maybe we really realize, but we're not that far away. It seems from even remembrance, and it seems a daft thing to say, but it'll be on us in no time. But we, we think of the, the sacrifice of people that laid down their lives in, in the conflict of the wars and so on. And it's maybe a debatable point to some extent. What, what did they accomplish? What did all of that sacrifice accomplish and so on and so forth? Was there any real purpose to it? Did it make a difference in the end? But we look at it and we say, certainly in those worlds, at least it did make a difference. Uh, fascism, tyranny were stopped. They were opposed. Uh, we were spared uh, in the mercy of God from that coming into our land and dominating us. And Europe, to some extent, for a little period at least, was free from that kind of tyranny. But here the Lord Jesus Christ laid down his life to save us from something, to deliver us, the apostle says, to deliver us from the present evil world, to bear away our sins. So there, there's, a, there's a clear purpose in view. It's not a meaningless death. The Lord Jesus was doing something as he died. And Peter reminds us of what that is. Peter, remember, talks about how our sins were born by Christ upon his body on the tree. The Lord Jesus Christ bore away our sins. He took the load. He took the weight. And he presented himself as the one who would be the target of justice. So the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And it is with his stripes that we are healed. He gave himself to be a sacrifice for our sins. So that your sin, my sin, if we 
If we trust him, if we're believing in him, we understand that our sin was laid on him so that he would be punished as the one who owned those sins, the one who bore them. It's as if they were his sins, even though they weren't his sins. They were really my sins. They were your sins. But when he takes them, when he bears them, he's the one holding them. And in the eyes of God, then it looks as if he's the one who has committed those sins as the sin bearer. In the eyes of God's justice, he's the sinner, though he is sinless. He bears our sins. This, this is getting to what the gospel is about, that the Lord Jesus Christ actually died to accomplish something for this purpose of bearing away our sin, that we would be delivered from sin. But being delivered from sin is, is in a sense, part of it because not only who uh, uh, gave himself for our sin, but to deliver us from this present evil world. We're saved from not just the consequences of sin and eternity. That is, we're not just saved from hell, but we're saved from the power of sin today. This is the gospel too. Sometimes the gospel is being spoken of and defined in such narrow terms, all we think about is, well, Jesus died to save me from going to hell and to take me to heaven. Uh, as the gospel has all to do, uh, if not nothing at all to do with... And it is true that the gospel is much to do with eternity, that endless uh, nest that eternity is, that we would be with God forever and ever in heaven. But deliverance from sin is not just deliverance from its consequences. In eternity, but it's deliverance from the effect of sin in a fallen world. That the Lord Jesus Christ frees us from having to live to sin, to live under sin's control and domination, so that we can actually live lives that are free from the dictates of sin. Because sin would work as a, a law in us. And the Apostle Paul bemoans this fact that even as a converted man, he sees this law that is present in his body, in his members, he talks about it. And there's a law there that, that to obey these desires that we have, sinful desires, rebellious desires, doing what God would call us to avoid and not to do. And Paul says, well, who's going to deliver me from this? Who's going to save me, this wretched man that I am. I know what I should, what God asks me to do is a good thing, and I agree with that, but at the same time, I feel torn, I feel pulled. I know what it is to lust. I know what it is to want things that I shouldn't have. I know what it is to want more than I should have. I know what it is to covet. And he says, I feel wretched. Who's going to deliver me from this? And he says, with this, that he thanks God that through the Lord Jesus Christ, he will be delivered. Because this is why Jesus Christ has died. Put it in the context of the Galatian situation and problem. The temptation is, add these things on. Think of yourself as being a better child of God, a better Christian by observing these rules and regulations. Feel good about yourself. Who is going to deliver me from this subtle temptation. Who's going to deliver me from this wrong-headed thinking? Well, I thank God through the Lord Jesus Christ. He delivers me from that temptation to try and save myself and to feel good about myself because of what I do for myself. He saves me from that. From this present evil world. From captivity to Satan and sin. And then the this was God all along. And to show himself as the God of redemption. To tell forth his glory. To broadcast it. So that we would see and know that he is the God who saves. And that we would worship and adore him and love him because he is the God of salvation. Why would, why would God do this? So that he would receive all of the glory. And so we know that it's not an accident. 
Christ is on that cross in obedience to the will of God. He's there because God determined that he would be there. It doesn't detract from our responsibility. Remember in Peter's preaching in the day of Pentecost, he accuses the men that he's preaching to that with wicked hands, they had taken the Holy One and they'd crucified him. They were guilty of an offense. And then in the next breath, he says that God ordained that this would happen. And the two things are in conflict. The two things operate side by side. It's providence and man's ability. People have often asked, how do you reconcile the two? Well, remember, you only have to reconcile things that are opposed to one another. You never talk about reconciling two friends. If you talk about reconciliation, then there's been a fallout, there's a disagreement, they're not friends anymore, and they need to be reconciled. God's sovereignty and our responsibility are not enemies. They don't need to be reconciled. They're both realities that run parallel. The fact of the matter is, God sent Jesus Christ into the world for this express purpose, to deliver us from the present evil world. So this is if you like, who Jesus Christ is, getting to the heart of the gospel that the Galatians need to be reminded of. And then, just, who's it for? I've kind of mentioned it here in, in passing. But look at verse 5. To whom, speaking of God, God the Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. What's the gospel all about? Lord, and God is to receive all the praise. All the praise. He gets all the praise. He gets all the glory. Because salvation is all of Him. And it has nothing to do with me. And this brings us to see another reason why then the temptation and the influence of the Judaizers and the temptation to have a religion of the add-ons. It's what I do. I've done this and I've done that. And it's dangerous because what does it start to do? It starts to set ourselves up as little gods where we worship ourselves, where we praise ourselves, where we think well of ourselves, and we start to depend upon ourselves. But I can't depend upon myself. I, I don't have anything about me that is worth praising. There's no good thing in me. And therefore, as we close this morning, it's all about praising God. It's all about trusting Jesus Christ exclusively. It's all about His grace. And so, as a letter is written to recovering addicts who foolishly have thought for a moment to pick up their old habit, and to go with it for a period of time. The letter is written to say, oh, come on, see what you're doing. You're going back to something that wasn't able to do you any good at the time. You've been shown the better way, the right way. Lay aside all these other things that are superfluous, all these other things that are actually unnecessary baggage that's going to weigh you down and cause you to drown. Simply look exclusively to Christ, content and satisfied with nothing and no one other than Christ himself. Now, we, we hear that and we think it's too simple, it's too easy, but that's the gospel. It's all of Christ with nothing else. Rest there, dear child of God. Be satisfied.